when I realised where I was in an outback desert landscape of Australia. I continued to clasp my shoulder as I ran on. Stacy took one last shot at me before I was able to make it down a hill. On the way down, however, I tripped and fell forward. I began to roll down, down and down, making all the effort I could so that the sand would not enter the open wound. I then finally reached the bottom. I looked up to what must have been at least a 60 foot drop. However, thankfully it was gradual enough and the fact that the sand had broken my fall enough so that I avoided having any more major injuries. However, I did still have my bleeding shoulder to deal with, but I needed to get away from Scacy as quickly as I could. I found a large rock that was perched and sticking out. I quickly made my way behind it, scrambling desperately in the hot sun. I made sure to make myself appear as small as possible, so that from the top, I would not be able to be seen by her. Then again, I would have no idea where she was. I couldn't exactly look round. That would give away my position, and I won't be able to hear her coming either, until she was practically right next to me. There was no point in making another run for it, not yet. From here on, it was just flat land, and if she was standing up there at the top, even if she was a terrible shot, she'd be placed at the perfect place to try and take me out. Though at least I did have that advantage. She was a terrible shot, and I did appear to be a good deal faster than her. I realised I had two options. Wait for everyone to presumably regroup, and for either the security USB or someone to come and capture Stacy, or continue moving, though I had no idea where I was. There was a good possibility that I could die out here, and it wouldn't be related to my wound at all. I waited a good five minutes on high alert, making my hearing acute so that I could hear any signs of movement, but also keeping my eyes open. If I could see sand starting to pour down, then I would know someone was walking down the long hill. There was the possibility if Scacy did tr attempt that, then maybe she would fall like I did. Then again, she didn't have a wounded shoulder, and she wasn't trying to desperately run and get away from someone who was very, very trigger-happy. I quickly checked my pockets for anything useful. I didn't have much in terms of survival gear. I did have some paracetamols which I took two of. It probably wouldn't do much about the pain I was feeling in my shoulder, but hopefully it would try and make me forget about it. Like a placebo effect. Other than that, I had half a tube of Mentos, which was my only food source, which obviously would not sustain me for very long. Though I wasn't planning on being out there for very long either. I also had my phone along with a power bank to keep it charged. I checked it to see if there'd been any transmissions or anything from USP, or there was nothing. I thought it was worth maybe actually making a phone call on my phone. No, right? Unfortunately, it was unable to pick up any network. I then remembered I still had a USP communicator. Unfortunately, when I reached into my pocket to pull it out, the thing had been dented as I fell on it on my fall down the hill. There was the possibility that it could be repaired. Though I didn't have any tools nor the means to do so, I kept it all the same. After all, the homing device on it may still be working, and hopefully they might be able to track me that way. Though the thing is, USB had no idea I was here. Other than the trial, I not really kept up with informing USP of everything that I was doing. I was essentially unofficially retired, though they did say they might use me as a freelancer. They did with spats and... Well, you all know how that turned out. I then finally decided that I was going to rip my coat and repurpose it as a sling. After all, it was getting too hot to wear it anyway. If I'd have known that I was going to Australia, then I wouldn't have bothered even putting it on. Although this was necessary, I did still feel bad for doing it. I'd seen James work so hard on designing and making it. Well, when he wasn't on his PS4 anyway. And he'd give me X as a birthday present for my 24th. However, I needed it for this more. If I made a sling that was able to keep my left arm still, then that would mean my shoulder would remain more steady. Using my teeth, I was able to rip off the right hand arm and was able to tie a knot in X and use it as a sling. I also ripped off the rest of the coat, leaving only the top left hand shoulder and the left arm hole with my arm still in it. Although it would be warm, this coat did provide some padding 
I then ripped up some smaller sections of the coat as I untied Sally's scarf that was around the wound. I then placed the ripped pieces of coat on top of the wound, then retied the scarf tightly. The pieces of coat provided a cushion, as well as being able to absorb more of the blood that was still dripping out, though not as rapidly. I reckon that must have been of the heat. The blood that had already accessed the wound was now drying up, making an effective plug. Kind of like when you get rust all over a pipe, and the rust continues to block the entire pipe. This, although not perfect, now gave me full access of my right arm, being able to use it freely without having to support my shoulder. As I completed this and started to feel a bit of self-gratitude from it, I froze as I heard the sound of boots walking through the sand, getting closer and closer to me. <laughs> I had to make a decision, and make it quickly. I took a few shards of my coat that I had not used, and threw them to my left. I could then hear the sound of the book stop, and scuffle in that direction. I then darted off to the right, making sure not to run in a straight line, thus making me harder to target for Scacy. However, I didn't hear any more shots. Why was this? I wondered, as I continued to run. I then realised she must be running out of bullets. After all, she wasn't a professional. She wouldn't be fully equipped for this. She would only have a handful at most. So now she was saving them so she could absolutely be sure she would kill me. Still though, this was only a guess and I was hardly willing to put it to the test. So I continued on. I must have ran for at least a mile and a half before eventually reaching a point of exhaustion. Mainly due to the fact that I lost quite a bit of blood. Still though, on the upside, the blood had ceased to gush out, and was now only the occasional few drips. I took a look at myself, and saw that it had gone all the way down to my jeans. I had no idea at this point if Scacy was still following me. Had I lost her? Or was she just behind me, catching up? I didn't know. Regardless, I had to rest. Unfortunately, there was no shade, so I had to sit on the hot sand. I was beginning to get pretty thirsty. My throat was beginning to clench and become dry, and I was beginning to feel very faint and dizzy. Then, I spotted a lizard. It wasn't moving, and it didn't appear to be interested in me. I didn't like what was going through my brain, but regardless I still did what I did. I quickly went onto my knees, and then was able to lean forward far enough to snatch the lizard. I then held it in my left hand which was holding the sling. Then, using my right, I broke its neck. It was the quickest and least painful way I could think of of killing it. I then proceeded to bite off its head and I drank its blood. I felt so disgusted with myself, but the taste of blood it was so fruity and vibrant. That delectable taste delighted my taste buds. I drained the lizard completely dry. I even sucked out what remains I could. Being Park Scarver in this situation was at least some advantage. Having a thick and luxurious fur coat around you, as well as wearing clothes on top of that, may not be in terms of heat. Perhaps being able to drink the blood of other animals like that. While I did find it disgusting, I did enjoy the taste, and it was, at the very least, keeping me alive. I then placed the remains of the lizard in my coat pocket that remained, where I'd also kept the mentos and any other things that I thought may be useful in. While I had drained the lizard of all its blood, if I required something to eat later on, then at least I would have some sort of food source that wasn't Mentos. I now had another decision to make. 
Do I stay where I am? Do I continue on? Or do I attempt to go back? I was just about able to see the tracks in the sand that I'd left. However, they would most surely be gone in a matter of hours. So if I was going to go back, then I'd have to go now. Otherwise I'd have no idea in which direction to go. Still though, if Stacy was still hunting for me, then that would be going closer and closer towards her. The drowsiness started to hit me again. I had to make a decision, and I had to make one quickly. But before I was able to, I started seeing a mirage. But not just any kind, this one was walking, walking towards me. But one that I recognised. I then started shouting, No! No! No, you! I'm sorry! But I am taking good care of him! And I promise you, he's never be alone! I should have been there! I should have been there! Uh, but I wasn't. I never was. Even at the hospital, when I promised that I would be. I was never there for you, Dorothy. The mirage was of Dorothy. Not as how I last saw her, but of how I liked to remember her from when we first met. Still having hope, still full of life, with a hopeful and prosperical future, which I had ruined. I was starting to completely lose it, not able to think straight. Most likely what this brought this mirage on was probably the fact I was thinking that if I didn't get out of here and survive it, I wouldn't be there for James. I'd have not only let down another person, but broken several promises. I knew in myself that James didn't need me, he never did. I was the one who needed him to give my life purpose. I then stood up to the mirage of Dorothy, which now appeared to be standing in front of me. I looked this mirage of Dorothy in the eyes, and I told it, No matter if I'm with Sally, or someone else, or no one at all, and no matter how old I get, I will never forget you, and you'll always have a place in my heart. I then stupidly attempted to kiss the mirage, which then vanished. I then almost fell forward, which jerked me back into reality. I then decided to make my way back the way I came. At least that way I knew there was civilization. And if I did run into Stacy, well, it was just me versus her. True, she had a gun. But if I was able to take it by surprise and be fast enough... Then I would have all of the advantages. I continued to slowly walk and make my way back. I probably covered about quarter of a mile, when, in the distance, I spotted another familiar figure. However, I was sure this one was real. It was Stacy. It looked like she was on high alert, though her gun was down by her side. I decided to keep the distance that I was away from her, and in Skeg's sidestep outwards. So hopefully I could maybe circle round behind her. I moved slowly as she continued to push on. I could tell that Skeezy herself was beginning to run out of energy. Her walking was slow and clumsy, as she seemed to be forcing her legs to continue to plod along through the sand, whereas the rest of her body was telling her to stop. I continued to keep my distance and allowed her to edge forward more and more. I don't think she was able to see me, probably due to a combination of my eyesight probably being better than hers, but also the fact that I was facing away from the sun and she was facing towards it, and I would probably blend in better with her surroundings. Then, it finally reached the point. She was now in front of me, and she had not spotted me. I was then able to edge myself closer and closer making sure to stay out of her peripheral vision. My target was simple. Get the gun out of her hands by any means necessary. She had two arms to use, however, whereas I had the use of one. I then decided that I would also use my legs. I got to as close as her as I could, 
and tried to make as little noise as possible. I then put my leg in front of hers. I then used my free hand to push her forward, tripping her up. As she twisted as she fell, I was able to snatch the gun out of her hand as she dropped to the sand below her. I then pointed her gun at her and then said, Just stay down there, because unlike you, I really don't want to use this thing. She then replied to me with, Go ahead, shoot. You can kill me. There'll be someone else to replace me. And eventually, one of them will kill you. Do you think this is going to solve anything? Murder? So if you think that I really did murder all those people, do you think murdering me is going to solve it? You are the symbol for it. If we kill you, the symbol dies. Then we will be able to rebuild. We're already rebuilding. Stop living in your own little delusional world. No, this is all a trick. These charities are just a facade to try and change people's minds on you. But we know the truth. We who's we? And who are you anyway? And who is this we we're talking about? I'm Stacy Campbell and that's all you're getting out of me. Whatever. I'm sure the authorities will be able to get more out of you than I could. They can take all they like. It won't stop our movement. Really? Another radicalist? Do you know what every single radicalist group have in common? That they all end up failing. Eventually, it'll all fall apart. No, and we are not radicalists. We can see the truth. What bloody truth? I'm hiding nothing. I've been telling nothing but the truth. You're just making up conspiracy theories. And you know why? Because it gives you something to blame. Something to feel better about. Hmm? Let me guess, you are blaming things on things beforehand that weren't actually the cause. Or you were over-exaggerating it or falsely accusing, were you? You people never change. You're always the same. Well, you know what? It doesn't matter. Come on, get up. We're going back. I am not moving from this spot. Alright then, fine. I then placed the gun in my pocket and continued walking off. Stacy then shouted. Wait, where are you going? Back to civilization. Gonna get myself looked at and hopefully everything gets hunky-dory and I'll go home. What, you're just gonna leave me? Here? Sure, why not? You're not hunting me down anymore, so now you're not my problem. What, so you'd like me get away? I'm gonna do nothing to stop it. You can stay there all you like and die either of heat exhaustion, starvation, of thirst. Do whatever you like, I don't really care. But you... Goodbye, Stacy. I can't say it's been pleasant. After that, I was unable to hear her voice. It took me another half hour. However, I then came across a familiar sight. The sight of the shuttle that Stacy had shot the fuel engine to. I then was relieved to see security personnel gathering. One of them spotted me and got the first gig staff to follow. I'd been gone for just over an hour. They had sent out a search party, but had now been called off. They then sent me to the same medical facility they'd sent me to before when I'd stabbed myself. Eck, even to the same room. Okay, the room was not a coincidence, I actually requested it. The reason I did is because, well, it had a nice view out of the window. And while I was in that place before, it just... Well, I... They dreamt about all the things I was going to do once I got out of there. Getting to know James. Restarting my relationship with Dorothy. Possibly being a happy family. Unfortunately, only one of those things ended up coming true. I did get to know James only too well. But you know what? One out of three isn't bad. And hey, maybe I'll be able to accomplish two out of three. If things work out between me and Sally. And, well, Sally and James have been bonding together a bit. They're kind of being forced to, as she's uh, taking care of him in my absence. Tom still occasionally does, though not as often. Though, to be honest, I'm glad. I'm glad he's able to do what he wants now and he isn't just chasing after me or having to look after James and that. He's finally able to do what he wants to do for once. But to be honest, I don't think he was ever 
able to do while he was around me. I did take advantage of him, but I am glad he was able to see through that, and was also able to show me that. What is he doing now, you may wonder? I don't know. Is he relaxing in his house on his own? Is he out and about doing stuff? I don't know either. To be honest, it's not something we really talk about. And actually, it's something guys don't talk about in general. There's more important stuff to talk about. Like when one of the nurses came in and accidentally saw my arse crack while I was getting ready one morning. Yes, um, as for Stacey, well, I have no idea what happened to her. I do know she must have taken off at some point as they were unable to find her. Though to be honest, she doesn't concern me. She was just an average person. A radicalist, but an average person all the same. Though the people like her, the we, or the they, as I'm going to call them. I just wonder how many people are like her, and what lengths will these people go to? I mean, if one average Joe was going to do something like this, that happens to me. There's Casey crossing the deserts. Just think what a group of them might do. Ooh, God, I'd hate to think. James has changed his attitude. I think same in this hospital, and the same hospital, and in the same room, has reminded him of what it was like when, well, he first came in and saw me, and has uh, kind of made him backtrack to the nice or lovely James that was before. Probably once I'm fully healed, he'll go back to how he was beforehand. It's an inevitability. But hey, I wouldn't have it any other way. But you know what, you'll probably turn into that lovey govey James again whenever he wants something off his. I hear he fancies a Nintendo Switch now. I wonder how much sucking up he's going to do to get that. Hmm. But hey, I'll take the sucking up over whining and bitching over it. And demanding I guess him it. It's a much nicer way. It's not great, I admit, but it's a lot more uh, tolerable than the alternative. But, hey, yeah, everything's not too bad. Things are looking on the up. And I think now I can pretty much safely and hopefully confidently say that most people are, I wouldn't say over, but at least moving on from the events of me blowing up half the earth. Not saying that, it... I keep blaming myself. I mean, it wasn't me who technically did it in terms of, like, I didn't set up the explosives or anything like that. True, I was the one who pulled the trigger, but I wasn't the one who orchestrated it. And, um, I wasn't the one who, you know, planned it all out. I just did what I could. And hey, because of that, half the Earth is still alive. I know that's not much, but hey... Half is better than nothing at all. You know what, maybe I should stop talking about it. I think the more that I talk about it, it means that I can't move on myself, and I do really want to, so maybe if I stop talking about it, maybe I'll truly be able to move on myself. So, hey, those are things, and all they're pretty much um, caught up. And I just realised, this is the recording of the final episode of my second series of this podcast. Hopefully Six Heck Productions will ring you me for another. And this time actually tell me. Because no one other than me is doing this podcast, not unless I say so. Okay, you got that. Me. Right? Good. So, yeah, a lot of that. <laughs> it's been eventful, I'll say. And it's also a record, like a diary, of uh, everything that has happened to me. So in the future, I can look back on all of these events. And not necessarily be nostalgic or reminisce or anything like that, but... Just a reminder, it's always important to move on and keep going forward with all that stuff, but you can't blatantly 
ignore the past either. Besides, it's from past experiences and what we learn that drive us forward. It what, you know, helps us to keep going on. It reminds me of um, this old married couple who uh, used to live on my street when I was growing up. I didn't really ever speak or talk to them. I just, you know, occasionally see them when I passed by. But I remember they'd always uh, make it a job of uh, basically keeping their front garden nice and tidy. It was clear from their physical condition that it took a lot of effort and probably took a lot out of them. It probably exhausted them. But they did it regardless. Because they knew if they didn't, then their garden would get in a state. So regardless of how tired and how much effort it took, they did it anyway. I'm not sure if there's a less or anything to be learned from that, but I think it kept them active. It maybe kept them fitter and healthier than if it wouldn't. Just off doing a simple task like that. Then if they simply just let it go into dismay... They probably would have just sat around their house all day, every day, doing absolutely nothing. And who knows, would they have become more unhealthy or dying sooner? Presuming that they are dead, I don't know. If they are still alive, and by some miracle listening to this, then, um... Hello. I don't know your names. And unfortunately, I can't really remember your faces either. But, um... I remember your garden. So, yeah, anyway. Oh, um, so uh, visiting hours. Looks like uh, Sally's here on her own this time. But anyway, this will probably do it for uh, this um, podcast anyway. So, yeah, I'll uh, hopefully see you uh, next time. All right, all right, all right. I'm coming, I'm coming. Ugh. <sighs> Shoulders on the hill, but it still does hurt a bit. <laughs> okay, okay. I have to record this bit at the end. Uh... Oh god, oh god. So, um, Sally wasn't just coming here for a general visit, no. In fact, she's going to have to, uh, visit the hospital herself. Because she finally found out why she's been throwing up in the mornings. Because, uh, she told me that she's pregnant. With, uh, my child. Um, right. Okay, uh, I have no idea how to look after a baby. I barely know how to look after a 13-year-old. So if anyone has any advice, um, please give me it away. It's the nicer. Maybe not then, um, shit, what am I going to do? Oh, well... Oh, I'm looking forward. I'm going to be a, a dad. Again. You know what? I, I'm really looking forward to it.